All right, would you, uh, would you just pray with me before we start the message? Lord, I, I really want to just thank you uh, for your sovereignty. There's just been so many things, as Tony had mentioned during our prayer time, how you are so faithful. Um, I got to tell you, I don't know how anyone can get through life without you. I could not do it. And uh, I am just praying that your Holy Spirit would just fill every... Uh, inch of this place and that your truth would be made known to those who are here, those online, and uh, we just lift it entirely up to you in your name. Amen. So it was the fall of 1987. I was a sophomore in high school. My brother was living in Palatine, Illinois, and uh, he was attending a church uh, that was in Barrington. It was a fast-growing church that Uh, soon became the epicenter of a new process of evangelizing the world, which was the seeker movement. Now, those of us who've been involved with the church since the 80s know that that movement has literally transformed how we have uh, digested the gospel. There have been people who normally would have never darkened the door of a church who came in and received that word. And it has been something that certainly has transformed the way, the efficiency of how we have been able to further God's kingdom. In the message that we're going to be talking about today, the center of this scripture is a young ruler, and I would dub him the ultimate seeker. We're going to be talking out of Mark 10. And this is a story that is about as classic as apple pie, hot dogs, and baseball. It is one that we have heard many times. But as you know, when you study the scriptures multiple times, you always tend to glean something different because it's living and breathing. Now, we're going to start in verse 17. And I want to just ask you just a little bit of a challenge. While we go through this message, I want you to keep a couple words on the front burner. There's going to be certain um, texts that I just want you to kind of hold in um, a standby mode because we're going to go back to those as we kind of weave a, a tale that um, was something that inspired people during the World War II era. Okay, so let's start. In verse 17, As he went out into the street, that's Jesus, a man came running up and greeted him with great reverence and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get, that's a word that I want you to keep on the front burner, eternal life. And Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your father and mother. He said, teacher, I have kept from my youth all of these things. And Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. And he said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth and come follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. So there's a little bit of background on this If you go to Matthew and the other Gospels, they give a little bit more detail on who this particular young man was. He was a ruler. So what that meant was he was chief of a synagogue. And he had acquired a status in the Jewish culture at that time that normally would have been reserved for someone who would have been considered an elder, someone older. He had acquired a lot of property. 
And because he had done so in a very ethical way, he had also achieved great respect in the community. So not only did he have, he was religious, he was wealthy, well-respected, considered moral, and had power and standing. He had reached, in his mind, the apex of what he could at that time. He was well ahead of the curve of what most people had achieved in that culture and time. So he's laying out this portfolio of all the things that are going on in his life and everything is exactly where he wants it. But there is one thing that is bothering him. There's something that is lacking, nagging at him. There's a motivation that motivates all of us, which is fear. You know how we talked about the seeker movement? We're all seekers. It doesn't matter what you own, where you live, your job. We are all looking for the very same things. We're looking for community, right? Meaning, love, companionship. Those are things that we as humans all want universally. And this gentleman is no different. What's really interesting about this too is because he is a man of great stature, if you look at the, the text from, say, Matthew, he runs up to Jesus. This is something that Middle Eastern men during that time of great stature did not do. It would have been considered crude. Jesus at that time was considered a rejected teacher by the religious establishment. They wanted to kill him. And this is happening in a very public place. This isn't like in the woods somewhere. People are seeing this. So you are seeing a person of high stature running, kneeling before Jesus, asking, what must I do to have eternal life? There is a spiritual power and influence that the world cannot understand in this situation. This man understands that Jesus is powerful, that he knows what the answer is. It is something where... In, in the other Gospels, it says, Behold, like, holy cow, are you seeing this? Look at this, what's going on? I, I can't believe what's happening here. And it is shocking. It is something where this man says, I know I'm missing something, and you have the answer. But unfortunately for this man, the way he goes about it is it's almost like he wants to add a legal binder to a policy. I have everything covered, but that eternal life thing, I, I need to know how I acquire that. And it's not something that you can buy. It's not something you can earn. It's not something that you can compound interest over a course of time and, oh, finally, I've gotten to that limit where I have that eternal life. And that's something that's very foreign to him. Because up until that point, things have worked out very well for the rich young ruler. I'm going to stop for a second and I want to talk about history. Now, you know, I, people who know me know I love history. It is something that if you can control history, you control the future. Because history is something that you can learn from, you don't repeat the same mistakes. It is something that is definitely a gift from God when you can learn from the past to impact the future. There are two heroes that I hold in great esteem. I could not tie these men's shoes. That is the prophet Daniel, and a more recent hero would be Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Now, if you're not familiar with Bonhoeffer, he is a German theologian during the 30s and 40s. He grew up in a large family in Berlin. At age 12, he had announced to his family that he wanted to be a theologian. He studied in New York during the early 30s. From 1930 to 31, he had studied at the Union Theological Seminary in the city. But he got disheartened because what he found there was unfortunately what he had dubbed 
the greenhouse of liberalism and he said that there was no theology there and it, he was so disheartened that he went back to Germany and he was involved at the University of Berlin for many years. But as we know, as the 30s started to progress, there was a movement in Germany that was starting to take everything over. And of course, that was Nazism. The church that Bonhoeffer had dedicated his life to had sold its soul to Hitler and it broke his heart. It had heated up so much that he and his colleagues had to disperse because the pressure of them having to bend a knee to a teaching that was completely opposite of what God and theology and grace had offered to people was now being replaced by a political ideology that was nothing but pure evil. So there were people who he worked with who went to Switzerland and other parts of the world that weren't so impacted by the war. One of his closest friends went to Chicago and Bonhoeffer returned back to New York. In 1939, he came on a boat to New York Harbor and the minute that he stepped off that boat, he had a sickening feeling that he had made a very big mistake because he had hoped that once the war was over and he truly believed that Nazism would be squelched, he had to be there to help rebuild that German church that he loved so dearly. It took him a month to log a trip back to Germany and he returned. And I'm going to stop there and we're going to go back into Mark. So here you have this ruler who's asking Jesus all these questions. And it's really interesting because, you know, it's not like the ruler is arguing with Jesus. It's not like he's saying, but Jesus, but, but, but. No, he is accepting the fact that what Jesus is telling him is true. And he walks away. And is it an interesting that it's not like Jesus went and chased after him to close the deal? <laughs> so in verse 22, it says, The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear, and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. The price of eternal life was just too much. He was more enamored with the material, the physical than the spiritual. The price was just too high. So in 23, looking at his disciples, Jesus said, do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing. But Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult. I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. Now, I just want to preface this. It isn't as if Jesus needed this man's possessions. You know, we're talking about generosity, right? And it's not as if it's like Jesus needs the resources to further his kingdom. He doesn't even need us. It's a blessing that he even uses us in our flawed manner to further his kingdom. He does not need any of us. We need him for the purpose and the meaning to further his kingdom. So, yes, in a way it's about generosity, but in another way it's also more of an important step in transferring from the importance of physical things that are temporary to a spiritual thing that is eternal. For the Jewish people, eternal life was not something that was a quantity. It was a way of life. The word is ionis, God's life. And this was something that for the Jews they held dear because in their mind to have eternal life they had to be saved from salvation. You can see how the Jewish culture fit right in to what Jesus was about to incur with his death. 
Ionis, the life of God, age enduring, eternal life. So in verse 26, that got their attention. And then who has any chance at all, they asked. Well, Jesus was blunt. (laughs) No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. But every chance in the world if you let God do it. I want to read that again. Jesus was blunt. No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. But every chance in the world if you let God do it. Do it. I want to go back to Bonhoeffer. So you have this man who goes back, and I can tell you it would have been so much easier for him to stay in the United States, a safe haven from what was happening in Germany. What happened after 1939 to Bonhoeffer literally is a script that could be made into the most thrilling movie you could ever imagine. (laughs) This is a man who became an agent for that government, but he used his contacts and his influence not to help Nazis, but to spread the German resistance. He traveled to different countries, wrote many different types of books. He was even involved in a unfortunately failed assassination plot against Hitler. And this was the thing that actually got the Gestapo's attention. They didn't want to believe that this was going on. And at first they they treated it like it was some minor fraud case. But then when they started to realize how involved Bonhoeffer was in the resistance against Nazism, of course he was arrested. He wound up being transferred to different camps. Some of those camps were the infamous Buchenwald camp. And then he was transferred to a a Gestapo prison. And the accounts of people who knew him during this time had said no matter what condition he was in, whether he was being transferred in military trucks or he was in barracks with chains rattling on the floor, he was always preaching the gospel sharing God's good news. Well, by 1945, April to be exact, he was at the Flossenburg camp and he was hung. This was mere days, literally days, before the Allied forces had come to free the POWs in that camp. That's how close he was to being saved. There were accounts where there was an SS doctor who remembers when Bonhoeffer was hung and he had said he had never seen someone who was so just completely at ease and calm and submissive to God's will. And when he was hung, he was dead within seconds. I have to believe that God had mercy on him with the faithfulness that he had shown to him and what Christianity was about. There was a Royal Air Force pilot who was a friend of his and had known him. And he had said, I remember his last words. He said, this is the end for me, but it's the beginning of life. Ionos, the life of God. So to wrap up, Mark, you look at what Jesus had to tell his disciples and how he reacted to this rich young ruler. From a seeker-sensitive movement, people would be like, well, I guess Jesus didn't, just couldn't close the deal. He must have failed. And Jesus is like, you know, there is a price that has to be paid for eternal life. This is not some superficial interest in eternity, that has to be confronted. Now, one of the things that we need to know is when this confrontation or this exchange of words happened between Jesus and the rich young ruler, it was in an area east of the Jordan. It was called Purea. He was on his way to Jerusalem and this was at the very end of Jesus' 
ministry. He was heading to Jerusalem where he, was, he knew he was going to be confronting just a painful death. If anyone knew what the cost of eternal life was, it was Jesus. You have to look at it from this standpoint. When Jesus looks at all of our lives, okay, he sees the beginning, the middle, and the end all at the same time while we're going through things. There is a level of grace that he has for us. But like inflation that erodes a currency's value, if the idea of grace and love is not equally balanced with truth, the value of grace and mercy starts to erode. It has to be balanced. It can't just be grace. Jesus loved the man, but was stern and blunt with him. There is grace and there is truth, and they have to be balanced. There is a price to pay for eternal life. It is not a product. It is not a commodity. It is a way of life. Ionos, the life of God. I'm going to share a personal experience as I conclude this message. When I was a sophomore in college, I came home for the holidays to have um, just you know time away from school. I was having dinner at my aunt and uncle's home, um, and uh, my grandfather was there. My grandfather lived right next to me when I was growing up. It was a great thing. I, I loved my grandfather. He was a tough as nails, Chicago um, carpenter. (laughs) He was from Norway. This is a man who cross-country skied in the fjords of Norway when he went to school growing up. And he came over as a first-generation immigrant over on the boat. And um, a wonderful man, (laughs) really was. But I have, um, of course, my mom, and then I have an aunt. And during that time that I was having dinner on that holiday, um, that holiday season, he had given me a box, and I had opened it, and it happened to be a watch that he had fully restored. The reason why this watch is so important is because this is a watch that my mom and my aunt had given him as a gift when they were little girls. This was a watch that was a present during the height of the war, probably in the early 30, or late 30s, early 40s. When my mom had passed away from cancer in 87, I can remember that summer walking over to talk to my grandfather. He had a habit of sitting in his front yard listening to the Cubs games on an old GE radio. And I can remember seeing him weeping, heartbroken, because my mom was the apple of his eye. This was one of the things that allowed him to have a direct link to my mom, even though she was gone. And I know him giving me this watch was was of a significant importance. I can still remember seeing his face when he gave it to me, wanting to see my reaction. And it really was something. I'm a watch collector, and this watch sits in a prominent area in the case of all my other watches. But the value of this watch is not in the gold. It is a, the the brand of that watch is a very vaunted brand that many collectors would pay a handsome price for. The real value is in the back of the watch. And there is the first initials of both my mom and my aunt. And it was something that, even though there is a material aspect to this watch, there's an eternal aspect that my grandfather realized. It was something that meant more to him than just a timepiece. So for him to hand it to me, he knew that I would wind up 
allowing that watch to impact other generations. He knew I was going to have kids, and my son Hunter is a watch collector as well. And when I pass away, he is also going to have that watch. When you look at what is happening in our culture today, the things that we value are not eternal. Even in the church, they are not eternal. We focus on the physical. And Jesus is challenging us. It's Ionis. It's not a product. It is a way of life that starts now and goes into eternity. Father, I want to thank you for what you have shown us and how it is that we are to live an eternal life. It is not a quantity. It is a way of life, the life of God. I pray that we would be able to understand and utilize this in our own life, not only for the enrichment of ourselves, but for the furthering of your kingdom. It is a foreign concept, not to you, but to us. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict us to live that Ionis life.